I don't know what is going to happen. Maybe, in the blink of an eye, there'll be a meteorite which is coming tumbling down, a brain which is falling apart. Maybe there'll be, I don't even know what. The main point is to become aware that every single moment, there's a breath of life that comes through and you're out of control. Olivier, you have been quoted as saying that the artist is like a virus. And as an artist, what do you mean by that? As you know, from the beginning, organic life has been functioning via the exchange of information. For two billion years, there was nothing but bacteria and viruses exchanging information. A bacterium infiltrated another bacterium, or a virus infiltrated another virus. It implanted a genetic messenger into it and transformed the bacterium that had been thus pierced and, quite literally, brought into it some of the elements that first had belonged to the virus. Therefore, the artist is also a part of an organism who wants to, who attempts to make his audience, his spectator, realize how he feels about things. Hence, I create images, and I want these images to penetrate the spectator's brain to make him transform inwardly. I believe that every artist wants to move the viewer inside so that, all of a sudden, the spectator tells himself, OK, I certainly haven't seen this. I bring you images so you may have another standpoint on the world. I have um, two questions now. First of all, you're using a very technical definition of virus mm -hmm. and many people would just see virus mm -hmm. as perhaps something which was dangerous. Yes, yes we are dangerous. The artists? Yes, yes. we are dangerous, but um, there's a uh, this danger is, is also interesting. <laughs> Incidentally, we are dangerous in all of the totalitarian countries. The men of politics get rid of the well, I was going to say of the viruses. They get rid of the artists and philosophers because these make you go a little bit further. They present you with the images that, all of a sudden, make you become aware of the reality. And um, when we come away from a good movie, we keep the images inside our minds. The filmmaker has put inside us the images that will stay with us for the rest of our lives. A good movie, a good musical piece, their fragments resurface within us not unlike viruses. It shows the merit of a good novel when, suddenly, there comes a phrase that takes hold of you entirely. It envelops us, and then there is something really akin to the virus. But it's very positive, in fact, because it makes it possible to move our vision somewhere else. Finally, we look through someone else's eyes, and it's something magnificent, as a matter of fact. Films like Samsara with Ron Frick um, is Ron Frick. Yes. Discarnate, mm -hmm. and also your work featured in a music video by Mylène Farmer. Yes. Uh, what is it about your work that filmmakers are attracted to? This performance when I transform my face with mud, that I've decided to call transfiguration, mm -hmm. for the lack of a better word. I don't know if it's the right term, I haven't found a better one. It's a very moving performance that touches everyone, I think, because, to begin with, I touch the most sacred area of the human being, which is the face. And the face is the identity. It's the persona. When you touch the face, it means that you touch on the identity. So, in this performance, I turn up wearing a faultlessly tailored suit and a tie, all of a sudden, the character starts putting mud on his face. And it's very moving to see how that very moment when there's mud on the face, we see it in all of the rituals, whether they are African or Australian, etc. Suddenly, the whole body falls head over heels, tumbles down into another world, the beyond world. The body that used to be here, within our grasp, suddenly becomes so slightly sculptural, 
It becomes like a sculpture, like a stone. And it is as if it had passed into another world all of a sudden. Therefore, there is something very touching in this whole thing, when suddenly this entity, both alive and at the same time, the one who makes a transition to the art domain, the sculpture starts moving slowly and then starts to evolve more and more. And his face transforms into a whole range of bisitteries, of strange animals. When suddenly this entity, both alive and at the same time, the one who makes a transition into the art domain, the sculpture starts moving slowly and then starts to evolve more and more. And his face transforms into a whole range of beastries, of strange animals. And so you get such a contrast between this little bureaucrat that behaved properly and who suddenly gets into the state of what they call the inner man. What we have is this wonderful contrast between our world that is getting more artificial nowadays and, and technological, but that world maintains contact with the flesh, with the primeval mud. And I adore this contrast because you can feel very good here with all these cameras. You can have all of your technical equipment and nonetheless you are still in the flesh with your feelings, your identity, your fears, your desires. And these are stronger than anything else. You can have all the technology you want. Nevertheless, you don't stop being a creature that is easily moved for no reason. So in this performance, I'm saying it all with this mud. In other words, I'd like to express the fragility of my being and show I can have an identity that you may find very pronounced. When suddenly I'm setting off to a different world, so you ought to ask yourself, what is going on? And that's how the bare minimum of mud, I'm going to retrace the entire phylogeny. That is to say, the whole path that the creative evolution had to follow to lead it to the emergence of the human. There used to be fish, reptilians, amphibians, vertebrate species and so on, up to the humankind. In such a way, I travel forth in time, and I transform myself into all of these creatures at a baffling pace. As I'm able to sculpt myself a hog snout, all in a matter of seconds, and then transform myself into a deer or transform myself into an orangutan with enormous speed. Therefore, I've invented something that I believe to be unique in its own way in the art history. I may sound presumptuous saying this, but I don't see it anywhere else. I mean, the mask always existed, but to the best of my knowledge, there has never been a moving mask. Let's say you're going to a dance event where you're going to dance and, and so on, and you're wearing a certain mask. It might be an antelope mask, it might be a jaguar mask, but this mask doesn't get transformed. Whereas I make myself a mask, and what's impressive about it, that I move the face. I dissect it, I open it up to all the directions, and of course there's an identity for every mask, and I'm curious when I make myself a certain face. I start to incarnate, and then I enter another world. But naturally, besides this metamorphosis of the mask, what I wonder is to become aware of my identity. What am I? I'm just like this man in Beckett's Unnameable, in the way I keep asking, what is it? What is it that speaks through me? They inflate me with their words like a balloon. No matter how hard I try to deflate, I still can't hear anything but them. What is it that I'm saying exactly? That's what I'm asking myself. And that's Beckett for you. And it's also my own quest, which is to try to question the unnameable inside of us. This is interesting because you told me that the suit that you wear at the beginning of the performance mm -hmm. is something that was added at a later date. Mm -hmm. And you started by without wearing anything. Mm -hmm. And to me, that sounds like you wanted to answer that question, who am I? Mm -hmm. And then after you'd done it several times, the suit is then 
for other people. Because I want to know, first of all, what you learnt from doing this the first time, or maybe the first ten times. And do you continue to learn from this performance every time you do it? The idea came from Ron Frick when he offered me to participate in his film, Samsara. In fact, Ron Frick wants me to render the world the way it is today. And in the world, as of today, there is still plenty of beauty. But the more power we're given by technology over the planet Earth, the more dangerous it becomes because it tends to create all the ills that we know. The deforestation and so on and so forth. The loss of a whole variety of rituals and languages. And so he told me, um, it would be interesting if you had your suit and tie, because you're going to represent this average technocrat who is in the service of that technology, but who, at a certain moment, realizes that he said technology gives him all the power, but also makes him lose memory. And then there comes a moment when this technocrat feels the need to veer towards Earth, to re-establish contact with the Earth. Because the man was born from clay, and he needs to maintain contact with clay, or else he will disconnect completely from this world. He will lapse into some kind of solipism. I mean, a kind of inherent pride of inner arrogance, of egotism. He will only gaze at his own navel and see nothing else. He will forget about the nature and run his head against a brick wall, so to say. Anyhow, I impersonate to the best of my ability the very respectable character who, at a certain moment, can't stand this time and all this world anymore. He needs to take a deep breath, a deep breath of the fresh air. And so he goes back to the earth to rediscover his roots. This is a main idea. So I go on with my performance. I did it for the first time in 1999, alone in my workshop. Actually, it was something really bizarre after a month off. As you know very well, every artist goes through moments when he creates nothing. He's miserable, he's sad, it's, it's complicated. And so, out of the blue, the idea came to me that I was disconnected from myself in a way. I was a bit like this character of, of Ron Frick, who's out of touch with the Earth. And I told myself I need to find a way to reconnect. This strange idea came to me as I said to myself, I'm going to reassemble all the elements I use in my work. I'm a painter, so I'll use some paint. I'm a sculptor, so it's mud. And I'm going to dive into it. I'm going to put myself inside this stuff. When you create a picture, you want to immerse yourself in the painting by experiencing it. When you make a sculpture, it has to speak. The sculpture has to speak. And for it to speak, for it to be alive, you really need to immerse yourself into it. Just like a virus, you need to get inside it. You need to invade it, and it must become almost alive. So I got to the point when I told myself, go ahead and get inside your mud, get inside your painting, become your painting. And then I started to imagine, blindly, but luckily, I had the idea to put a camera in front of me. And so I did it, in my mind, I started figuring it out. Okay, I have my face right here, I've got two eyes, I make myself a mouth, I made one face, two faces, three. And then you can see it clearly on the camera that it took me about 10 faces before I reconnected with myself and then I went away. A month went by and one of my daughters told me, Dad, there's something really weird on the videotape. She started to play it back from a certain moment and she didn't even recognize me, the way I was behind all the mud. And when I saw this, I said, wow, what's that? And I knew it right away. I told myself, it's incredible. So being a painter after 20 years of painting with my experienced eye, what do I see all of a sudden? It turns out that doing it blindly, it is more interesting. So when you're doing that, do you hope that it looks good or do you know that it looks good? What I want is to get in touch with myself. In fact, this is a sort of therapy to reconnect with myself. And I don't ask myself the question about the outcome. And that's the whole trick. Every time you create a painting, or, or when you dance, or when you sing, or even now when I'm speaking, I hope that indeed I will be persuasive. And that is the very reason why it may all go wrong. 
quand je parle maintenant là, je me dis j'espère que je vais être persuasif. It's because I get caught up in the game. When you paint and you go like it, there I do two eyes, a mouth, so on. And then you take a step inside. Ah, no, the right eye is way below. It's less interesting this way. You can't imagine how much energy and willpower it took Picasso, probably in 1917. I'm not sure. To dare to make a face with two eyes on its side and with a mouth like that. It's an unheard of energy. All of us, we're, we're all about mimesis, about reproduction, and it has to be done well, it has to look nice, but fuck, who gives a damn about it? What important is whether it's true? We've entered a different field of art, the one of truth. To try to reckon things the way they are, to try and dwell in their presence, the real presence that imposes itself. Because by doing this, you reveal yourself. Who am I? What is it? And by virtue of working in a blind way like this, by making a face, and then another one, and then another one, and another, and another, that's the way life itself has been functioning for over three billion years. As you know, when it comes to life, it's not some measly good lord who's there to say if it's good or if it's not good. When the bacteria mutate, the result is completely random. And it's up to nature to make choice. Indeed, the organism needs to be viable, and, and therefore the mutations happen permanently all over the place. And little by little, there are things that come out of it. But the spectrum is much wider when you work in a blind way. That's to say, when you're working according to your gut feeling. So, what came first? The method or the intent? Because putting clay on your face mm -hmm. is not, was that something you, you went, in order to, to answer this question, I need to put clay on my face, mm -hmm. or did you put clay on your face and then experiment? In the beginning, the very first performance with me being alone in my workshop, the intention was to reconnect with myself. We all have those kinds of moments when we see them split into pieces. Our brain is so taken apart by numerous relations that sooner or later our own self, our, our I, is shattered into bits. And you need to manage to bring the pieces back together in order to make your actions more effective. So, in the beginning, it really used to be a kind of exercise, let's say, like yoga, for instance, trying to reconcile with oneself. And then, when I saw the result, I understood that there were two things about transfiguration there. First of all, the transfiguration turned out to be an incredible mask, generating matrix. By which I mean that a whole bunch of masks were moving across my face as well as a whole lot of sculptures, because I am mostly a painter and a sculptor in the first place. So you've worked, you worked with clay before? Yes, I'm a painter and a sculptor above all. So I've been working from a certain distance, initially, and incidentally, here it is. So I would like to claim that I'm on some sort of shortcut in the history of art, between painting, sculpting, and becoming a dancer or an actor. There we see this transition from a painter to a dancer, or from a sculptor to a dancer. In my attempts to make my way into this work of art, I became a sort of dancer-performance artist. That's how the transition occurred. But I never stopped being a painter. That's to say, when it comes to every performance, I try to make beautiful faces. That is, touching and powerful ones. But I also decided to go with the first idea, under which this performance is a technique of self-presence. By which I mean that, of course, I intend to make this series of masks to transfigure myself. However, these series of transfigurations are not planned in advance. Here I follow Artaud's idea from his theatre and its double. You need to bring life into theatre and into dance. It doesn't have to be scripted too much. If it is too scripted, it narrows the thing. It becomes something overplayed. For the spectator to feel the life that comes through, there needs to be a certain portion of freedom. Because that's how we are at every given moment of life, in freedom, here, right now. I don't know what is going to happen. Maybe in the blink of an eye there'll be a meteorite which is coming tumbling down, a brain which is falling apart. Maybe there'll be... I don't even know what. The main point is to become aware of the fact that at every single moment, 
There's a breath of life, and that comes through, and you're out of control. You're just slightly in control. It's along this line of tension all the time. Let's say, exactly like an embryo. During the creation of an embryo, there are two things. There is preformation, there is a genetic code, and there is epigenesis. That is to say, the organism's reaction to the environment, and that one you can't predict. The environment always surpasses us. Thus, we're always on this borderline between preformation and epigenesis, or between the program. Like I have an intention, but if I want to express what life really is, I need to show to the spectator that I, myself, don't know where I'm headed. And very quickly, the viewer gets to see that I work blindly. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't see the result. I give my sight away to the spectator. When I came on stage, at first my eyes were open, and then I close them and I put mud over my face. That's when I tell the viewers, now, you are the ones who see. I don't see a thing. From this point on, I give you my sight. And I'm off like that. I set off on a journey and I become a kind of medium. That is to say, I, I try to keep into something deep inside of me more and more, into some sort of madness. And I bang my head against a metal plate behind me, and I try to get into a state that will resemble the trance the more I move on. But that's not a real trance, because just like a dancer, I stay in this ambiguous air. I mean that at the same time, I try to follow my inner feeling more and more, but I also keep that peripheral vision. That is to say, I'm still aware of being there on the stage. You are here performing at uh, Antigel, which is here in, in Geneva. It's an arts festival. What should we expect from your performance here at Antigel? So I acted out this performance again that consists in the work of modeling over face and, and scar, as I've just explained. But for me, this performance is still a sort of attempt to say, to cry out to something that I've felt very strongly inside of me for quite a long time. And from time to time, I get the impression of being incredibly lonely, to the point of telling myself, how can this be? People don't seem to notice it. How should I put it? We all inhabit a body. We've all got this sensation of living through a stunning experience that we are here only once and that it'll be over soon and then we are dead. And that is something unthinkable and that we are experiencing a fascinating event. But curiously, although it's not even so strange, the fact that there is such a pressure of life. According to the program that has been in the making for billions of years, as I've just said, which pressures us all into some sort of survival. And we are all programmed to establish relations of authority struggle, of possession, of extending the sphere of influence and so on and so forth. And it pushes us so much into developing these strategies of survival that it makes us forget the unfathomable character of being in this world. Qui font que nous développons tellement ces stratégies-là pour survivre qu'on en oublie. That's why I repeat, and I keep on saying that we all share some kind of collective hallucination. Please understand. Continue à dire, nous sommes tous dans une forme d'hallucination collective. Comprenez bien. We are in a collective hallucination, and we forget that unfathomable character. Every child at the age of 7 or 8 or 10 to 15 asks himself, what am I doing here and, and what is this world? Then he forgets it because he wants to mess around with his girlfriends, he wants to be the best in football, etc. And so we tend to forget. Whereas for me, this is one of the most incredible things. And when it comes to me for being there on stage, every time I tell myself, well, I need to. I'm like a karate master. I need to break through. I need to make them understand so that they go back to being aware of what the face really is. We see faces all the time. Then we end up in some sort of everyday routine. I look at faces all day long. I look at this world all day long, and I end up forgetting how incredible it is in its essence. 
So the fact of injecting incredible images, I distort my face, I open it up into your brain in a virus-like manner, doesn't have almost anything to do with a mortifying or morbid attitude. I can't emphasize it enough. I adore life, and it deals with this idea of becoming aware of the life and of the beauty. I'm amazed at the mere fact of being alive, that in the first place I will try to wake me up, and then to wake you up by telling, look, isn't this incredible? As a matter of fact, I would like to achieve is that the spectator sees my face as if it was being seen by an extraterrestrial during the first encounter. Just imagine what an alien that sees a human being, he would say, what an incredible creature. It's stupefying. Just like us, if we saw an extraterrestrial, we would say, wow, what's that? And there, as far as I'm concerned, I've become myself an extraterrestrial on stage. Although I arrive there faultlessly dressed, very clean, my hair combed back as it should be, and all of a sudden I transform into some sort of monster, but a monster in the etymological sense of the term. That means something that demonstrates what I really am, what is there behind my face. And what are those out there? Those billions and billions of neurons that function and work without any rest, that receive messages, that capture information and somehow try to keep up with all of it. But nonetheless, there is still a sort of identity. There is still something which says, me. So who is this me, after all? It's something that occurs progressively, with the rising tension becoming more and more intense. Though I would say that Firstly, on the whole, I try to keep the time in check. I mean that in the beginning you usually tend to go too fast, because you go after the audience to try and grip it immediately. You want to send out a ton of images right away, etc, etc. And you go too fast. So I keep telling myself, hold on, go slower, and retain control of yourself, that kind of stuff. So at first, I try to control the time, and little by little, I get involved into something. And this something is hard to identify, but it comes out as a kind of self-affirmation regarding my self-questioning. I try to perform a self-hypnosis to get into a character that will surpass me. That is to say, I get into self-hypnosis and there comes a moment when I'm no longer aware where I am and what I'm doing. And this character takes takes over me a bit. And that's where I want to go, because as I've been telling you, the first time I did this performance, I found it fascinating to see that blindly I was about to create some very surprising masks. So I tell myself now, you need to be even more than blind. And how do you go even more blind than blind? At the same time, you need not to see, not to hear, not to understand what I'm saying getting deafer and deafer, and even try to forget yourself, because from a certain moment on, I will not be like I was. I need to look good, I need to strike such a pose, I will stop seeing myself through someone else's eyes, okay? I need to become like a leaf which is caught in the wind, you see. Such a Buddhist image, if you will. But I need to let myself get carried away by something that happens according to some inner feeling. And after all, that's probably what a trance is all about. It does not have to rely upon someone else's judgment anymore. We are so reliant on the other's judgment, and this is terrifying because, of course, it is necessary for the sake of living as part of the group, but at a certain point, if we're all about the other's judgment, we get consumed by mimesis, and then we're nothing but clones. I'm sure enough, we have to get rid of this all. We have to cut ourselves off our mother's belly, to cut us off, well, you see, and then at a certain moment, we are going to get somewhere else. I would like to ask you what you think the purpose of arts festivals is uh, in the age of the internet. Performances have always been around. There have always been dancers that come out in the midst of a group of people and start doing things, and the raters that begin to narrate. Now we've set a framework. I think it used to happen in a natural way. I had a chance to live in sub-Saharan Africa for several years, and it was quite natural to stage certain scenes in a village square. Therefore, there are people that are caught in the game, and so on, without having to pay for the ticket, and so on. It just happens naturally. Now, we've entered an era of something far less spontaneous. 
But I think the stage, in a more global sense, is much more societal space which is freed from conventions, freed from codes. And by liberating yourself from codes, that's precisely what we do. We replay, we rewrite our life a little bit. Of course, we've lived in a certain way, according to this whole set of codes. But if, at one point, we rolled the dice all over again, what would the outcome be? And I believe that every artist has his own way of rolling the dice in you. And that's how he suggests another way of life at his own small scale. You don't rewrite life in its wholeness. But every time when you just say, wait a minute, what if we try it again? And I think that every writer discovers a new world. Every musician suggests another acoustic universe, as compared to what already exists. And the goal of creation is to go further. Hold on. Let's look a bit further. What have we got there? Let's exit for a little while this narrow world in which we dwell. Let's try to open some new doors. In the program for Antigel, they describe you as probably one of the most exciting artists of our time. That's very kind of them, but I think it's an overstatement. There are really great artists everywhere. As far as I'm concerned, I'm doing a special kind of work. I do think that I have found something original and unique with this work based on murder and so on. But I also create another work which, following the same principle that is entitled L'Enfermois, and L'Enfermois is a work where it's no longer my face, that I get to transform an infinite number of times, but the person that speaks is me. That is to say that I run inside a metal wheel, which I constructed. I get inside this wheel and I start to run, and I'm reciting a text. But the principle is for me not to know this text in advance. And so I have to let the words come to me. What am I saying? How? Where is it? What is it? Where? Who is it for? It's me. Here it's up to me. Here it's my place. Here I am at my place. It's my head, it's my brain. He can say whatever he wants, that doesn't solve the problem. Me, I'm still holding on. Me, I'm not giving up. And so I will say something on the lines. Dragonfly, snail. He who smells some sort of nostalgic stench, who entered like a demon through my ears, who wanted me to say things that I'd never heard before. And despite the fact that I knew very well that it wasn't my mother who spoke, I expected it would eventually be Marc Dupontel, or I don't know who, who had finally let me realize this dream and that had been haunting me for all these years. So I let the words come to me. And just like that, I let my hands talk in transfiguration. I need to let my hands talk. My hands need to go faster than my thoughts. Just like when I'm sculpting, at some point when I start to envision my hands at two fish, they go faster than me. And there, in, in quite a similar way, I let the words come to me because I also think that we are, we're always told, you don't speak if you've got nothing to say. Dear child, you need to go from A to B. But going from A to B doesn't allow you to do anything else than go from A to B but it could possibly be a good idea to pass through point C. And how do you get to pass through C? It's exactly by telling yourself, I won't go to B. I don't know where I'm going to go. I will let the words come to me. Beckett has a very beautiful phrase where he says, the words are seeking a mouth to enter. I think that we've got billions of neurons in our head that struggle to bring out words all the time, but we want to be in control. And it's really amusing to see at times when we're puzzled with a problem and it keeps getting us back into this loop. And we say, OK, leave me alone. I need to stop thinking about it. I need to think of something else. We see very well in this case that the neurons are fired up and the thoughts keep coming back. It's the same thing with a musical piece that you can't help recalling. As we can see there, in fact, this I who speaks is something really complex. And it's interesting to say at one point, step aside just for a moment, let it speak. And so I let a whole range of neurons, a wealth of words speak in me. And suddenly it starts to talk. It talks, it doesn't stop talking. 
So when I no longer try too much to direct it along a narrow path in front of me, or to keep a stiff hand on the rudder, I see a whole multitude of things awaken in me. Because in my opinion, it has been talking for billions of years. It doesn't stop talking. From the primordial soup of bacteria and way up to the French Academy. It's always the same thing, more or less. It doesn't stop talking. It squeaks, it never stops singing, etc. And it's really interesting to let it talk because you suddenly... A whole lot of fragrances that we have blocked become perceptible, and so on. As I've been saying just now, we are following a set of codes that are clearly marked and that compel us to walk in a straight line. But it's also interesting, for a short period of time, which is performing on stage, to get rid of all these codes. And the exercise of l'enfermoire that consists in letting your words come to you comes from there. In this case, I also get into a certain trance. And what I distort is not my face, but the speaker, the thing that doesn't stop talking. Suddenly, it is represented with a wider spectrum, and a whole bunch of things, of personalities, come out of it. I am inhabited, and you are inhabited by a whole series of identities that you've never imagined. And it's very interesting to let it all out. What's coming next for you? What's next? My dream, my dream precisely. We're now set for this transition towards the idea of what could come next. Transfiguration is very conveniently the type of performance where I'm on my knees, or at least I'm seated. So I work very little with my legs. But I get to give masterclasses more and more frequently in many places all around the globe. And that allows me to initiate people into working with mud. So I became aware that the whole body, when it is covered with mud and all the protuberances, because you can make yourself an enormous belly. I can transform myself into a woman. I can make a breast. I can make an enormous shoulder, etc. I work with students on these transformations, and I can bring bodies together. I can cover them with mud and produce monsters with two or three heads. My next idea is to come up with a show involving different dancers or actors, with whom I will work on a group performance to create a real staging. Because with all these bodies covered with mud that start to distort and to move unexpectedly, I create a whole series of transitions involving bodies with their big stomachs suddenly starting to sag down and, and so on. It gives an incredible pace to their movements. Or a head that starts to weigh 30 kilos, and the dancer goes sideways like this with his head. All these things change completely our attitude toward our body. And it's really exciting. So this is one of my upcoming projects, to stage a show with multiple actors, and this very idea of distorting the body with mud. When I was researching your, your videos, mm -hmm. I found a video of um, a young man in America mm -hmm. who decided to film himself mm -hmm. watching your video mm -hmm. for the very first time. Mm -hmm. He'd never seen it before. Yes, 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 I see it. And he recorded his reaction, mm -hmm. and it was very funny. <laughs> yes. And I wanted to know if you wanted to hear what he said yeah. during this video. Yeah. So, um, first of all, he apologised for mispronouncing your name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, he's he, for what he says, he says, uh, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. I am so confused. Right. And then he said, well, do whatever makes you happy, mm -hmm. he was saying to you. Mm -hmm. um, you put hair on, mm -hmm. and he said, and he got very, he was like, but you have hair, Already? Mm. Why did you put more on? Right, right. Um, he said it was one of the weirdest videos on YouTube. <coughs> mm. And then he asked, uh, what's the point? Mm. And he, asked, he, he, he watched the whole thing and at the end he was saying, mm. what, was, what was the point? But it's really interesting because when it comes to this performance, you do have a character there who transforms his face. But no one can say... I mean, the spectator is embarrassed and he doesn't understand what the character is trying to tell us, why he does this. And if I make two eyes on one side of my face, does it mean that I'm happy or, or sad? 
So the spectator who sees this performance for the first time feels anxious. But what's really interesting is that I think that I managed to hit certain brain regions that haven't yet been stimulated. To say it differently, if I smile, you can understand that I'm glad. If I show you teeth, I'm not happy, etc. But if I make myself an eye there, or if I make two eyes there, or if I make a mouth here and a nose over there. One of his other comments was, I don't even know where his face is. And so there is confusion. You don't understand very well. Nonetheless, I do it on purpose, with a clear intention, and you can see how I insist, etc, etc. And so the viewer is really perplexed because he's had a loss of associations between these stimuli and some natural behavioral reactions. So he's destabilized, and this destabilization interests me a lot because I'm going to let him see something that he unlearned. That is to say, Taking into account the day-to-day -day routine of seeing faces all the time, we end up understanding immediately every small movement. We analyze it instantly, and there you get to revisit the face. And what I would find interesting by the end of this performance is for people to say, that's right, I haven't seen this, I haven't noticed that the face retains such a variety of possible forms. I haven't understood the hidden dimension of the face. I haven't seen the incredible metaphysical value of face, because the face conceals the identity. That is the inner being, and the inner being surpasses every one of us. Once again, this inner being is unnameable, that Beckett tells us about. In, in other words, it is something that you can never attain, and I'm trying to attain it all the time, but I never succeed. So the very definition of your inner self is precisely this thing that you can never reach. Because we are caught in this Godel's theorem that we've been talking about before the interview, by which I mean you can never attain your own self. We are overflowing by ourselves. There is something really strange about it. If you could talk directly to him and say one thing to this person who watched your video, what would you say? Look at yourself in the mirror. You are magnificent. 